Hi, welcome to Claremont. I'm Kathy Giannis. As a resident of the Hudson Valley, I visited many of the great old riverfront homes while on assignment, or strictly for pleasure. Claremont is one of the oldest and most beautiful of them all, and it has a strong association with the history of our state and nation. At one time, the Livingston family owned more than 150,000 acres in what is today Columbia County. The people who lived in this house owned an additional half million acres across the river. Before the American Revolution, the builder of Claremont could open his front door and boast that he owned everything he could see. It was only a slight exaggeration. A Livingston of Claremont attended the Stamp Act Congress. Another Livingston fought with the Continental Army at Saratoga and suffered through the bitter winter encampment at Valley Forge. Mrs. Margaret Beekman Livingston saw this house put to the torch by British soldiers during the Revolution. She rebuilt the house during the war and within a few years was able to entertain General and Mrs. Washington in her new home. Claremont's most famous resident was Robert R. Livingston, known as Chancellor Livingston. He was one of our founding fathers and the man who gave the oath of office to George Washington as first president of the United States. Later, he negotiated the Louisiana Purchase for President Thomas Jefferson. He also, with Robert Fulton, created the world's first practical steamboat. The home port of the steamboat was the dock here at Claremont. The last family to call Claremont home many years ago now was Mr. and Mrs. John Henry Livingston and their daughters, Janet and Honoria. I'm Honoria Alice Livingston McMitty, and this is my cousin. Elliot Dexter Elliot Hawkins. Hawkins, Honoria's mother and my grandmother were sisters. Yes, my mother's name was Alice Delafield Clarkson, and uh, she and father were distantly related, you see. And she always loved it up here on the Hudson River. As a mother, she was a very dynamic person. Yes, she loved us, having children and bringing us up, and she was interested in our education, and she was a terrific personality. She meant a great deal to us. Father was John Henry Livingston, and of course he was a great deal older when he and mother were married, so I think of him as an older person. And then he became very deaf so that we children couldn't talk to him. We could yell at him when he was very, when we were young, but after that you had to write everything down. Well, father was always interested in the woods and he'd go off cutting trees. I'd see him go off with his ax or his saw or something or other. And mother was doing probably sculpture upstairs. And I don't know what, Jonathan, I, whatever we were interested in, we'd be doing. Honoria's parents were married in 1906. The newlyweds enjoyed travel, and so it was natural, as well-to-do New Yorkers of their time, that they went abroad for their honeymoon. They spent their first two years of married life traveling through Europe and Northern Africa, to Egypt, Greece, Rome, Paris, and London. In 1908, they returned to their historic Hudson Valley home. Their first child, Honoria Alice, was born in New York City in 1909. Another daughter, Janet Cornelia, was born a year later. The Livingston girls spent most of their early childhood here at Claremont, where their family had lived for nearly 200 years. I think the idea of roots, that's, that was what was important to us, the feeling. And we were always proud of the Chancellor, for instance. He was one of the five who drew up the Declaration of Independence, that sort of thing. And when we learned history, it was always interesting to come across these names. And Naturally, with people coming to see the house, we knew it was important, even as children. Oh yes, always was a happy house for us. We loved coming back to it. I didn't have a favorite spot in the house, for instance, but I just liked coming in the front door and coming in. The general, uh, what is the word? Not ambiance, but the general feeling of the house. Well, this was always the room that the family had for entertaining. We lived in the big room there, but you entertained very often. Father and mother had dinner parties and that sort of thing, going way back, the early days. And you always received in the drawing room. Well, we never came in as children, we didn't come in. Well, because it was the drawing room. <laughs> you just didn't, it wasn't any reason for us, we had our own rooms upstairs. When Honoria Livingston McVitty recalls her childhood at Claremont, her thoughts are often drawn to the playhouse that was set up for the girls near their mother's cutting garden. 
Well, I'm walking up towards our, gre our old playhouse, which I remember as a small child having a very nice time, my sister and I came up every day, at least once in the day and sometimes twice. And we had all our own pet possessions up here that we enjoyed playing with, so that I remember it with great pleasure. When the children tired of the playhouse, Claremont's expansive grounds and the Hudson River provided great opportunities for outdoor pleasure. Oh, in winter you went coasting down this hill. <laughs> there was enough, if there was enough snow, there was always the trouble, there wasn't always enough snow. And in summer, I don't know. We played croquet on this lawn, of course, all summer. There wasn't that path in the middle and it, was, it made a very good croquet. So we always played croquet out here. We had an ice pond that we would go swimming in in summer or somebody's brook or something like that, but we, we never went in the road. And then anyway, with the railroad track there, it was hot to cross over we, and uh, the family thought it was dangerous. And then there was ice boating. The ice boating was great fun. Yes, father took us once or twice. He had an ice boat. He's it's still, it's still here somewhere, I think. Well, my mother put in the shrubs here and they're all of nice, flowering plants in the spring, you see, that was the idea. He called, she called this the wilderness. Well, this was the old peony garden, but we've had a great many different things in here, but there was a good many varieties of peonies. Mother had a collection of very nice ones. As a child, I remember it was operated because she'd have things in the greenhouse, and then when the peonies were out, she brought them down. They were very special ones. They really are good. And the old yellow rose is still there that comes in the early spring. That's a very old rose. She was very fond of roses. But she liked perennials. She really did. I don't think she cared much for annuals of the, of the two. She liked going out in the spring and seeing something coming up. She spent the winters here, and therefore to see the first green shoot and the first little flower meant something to her. As you might expect, Claremont was the perfect place to keep pets, and both Livingston girls loved animals. We always had dogs, and mother had a cat, and we children had dogs, the dogs. And then up at our playhouse, we always had rabbits and things like that that you could have in a cage. My sister had a riding horse later on, but I didn't ride very much. But she had a horse for riding. Oh, yes, the family had a peacock. Solomon, perfectly magnificent creature, who peck you. You couldn't get too close. He was really quite cross. But he was very beautiful, and he looked lovely sitting on the lawn. We had him for years and years until I think a fox got him. But he, he roosted every night right beside the house. There were shrubs right next to the, either this side or the other side, and he'd, he'd roost there. He looked perfectly beautiful. The household at a large Hudson River estate consisted of many people besides the family. There was a farm manager, gardeners, cook, maids, and other essential workers to look after the needs of the estate and its owners. We had governesses and, and, and nurses, and we had classes and things like that. Oh yes, we always had a coachman way, way back. His name was Christopher Meyer, and he was our coachman for a great many years, and then he married our nurse. So that was great excitement. Christopher was the one we had when we were very young, I remember. He drove us in the pony carriage. There was a Victoria that you went out in on Sundays, and uh, there was a wagonette that you, met, that you met you when you came up in the train and had a funny smell as children, you know, you got into that and you knew you were going home. That was a big old fashioned. And then of course there was a pony carriage for us children and a very pretty little carriage that mother drove with one horse. But we were late getting a car. My father was older and he liked the horses. I don't remember what year it was. Oh, about 19, 17 or 18, I think and we finally gave up horses. So that was late. When Honoria Livingston was 11, she sailed for Europe with her parents and sister Janet. Except for a few brief trips back to America, they stayed in Europe for the next six years. For much of that time, they lived in villas in Florence, Italy. Mr. and Mrs. Livingston firmly believed that travel was an essential part of a young lady's education. Well, I loved it. It was culture with a big C as far as I was concerned. I don't think my sister cares so much for it, but uh, I enjoyed all the traveling we'd do. We'd get in the, fa in the car and drive around all different parts of Italy, and that was pretty exciting at times. Oh, yes, we spoke French, we spoke Italian, we spoke German, all those things. We had teachers come out and give us lessons on those things when we lived abroad. 
The Livingston family returned to America just before Christmas in 1926. A month later, Mr. Livingston died at the family's winter home in Aiken, South Carolina. A few years later, Honoria Livingston met a charming young Irishman named Rex McVitie. They were married at St. Paul's Church in Tivoli in September 1931. And then the reception was here, out, and it was a lovely summer's day like this, autumn day. I will show that uh, I have photographs of it, which seemed to work out rather well. I don't remember how many people were there, but you could find that out. I enjoyed it, which I didn't expect to enjoy. <laughs> I don't know. I just had an idea that I wouldn't enjoy it, but I did. I guess because everybody was pleased and happy, and Rex was happy. And then we went abroad to meet his family. Had a nice time. Honoria and Rex McVitie honeymooned in Ireland. When they returned to Claremont, they moved into the gatehouse, which is called Sylvan Cottage. They spent half the year in residence at Claremont and half living in New York City or Florida during the colder months. When the United States entered the Second World War, Alice Livingston and her daughter Janet moved out of the mansion, which was too large to keep heated, and into the gardener's cottage, which Mrs. Livingston rechristened Claremont Cottage. Finding it more manageable than the big house, they lived there for the rest of their lives, opening the mansion only during the summers and for special occasions. In 1962, 90-year-old Alice Livingston deeded her family's historic house and grounds to the people of the state of New York. Two years later, she died at Claremont Cottage. Janet Livingston, who had never married but had carved out a successful business career on Wall Street, died in 1972. Rex McVitie died seven years later. Today, Honoria Livingston McVitie continues to spend part of each year in Florida and the summer at Claremont, where she enjoys spending time in her garden, visiting with friends and family, and occasionally meeting the thousands of children and adults who visit her childhood home each year. I live right on the place in a nice little cottage. It was always the ones that all the newly married used to live in. I love to come down here and see it looking so nice, and I know the family would have been terribly thrilled because there's something that I feel should be protected. It's part of the history of the United States, and we were very pleased when they took it over. I don't think I'd presume to speak for the chancellor, but I think he would certainly uh, join with those of us who would like to maintain the best elements of what's here now. I think he'd be terribly pleased to see how his place is maintained and how many people get the privilege and the thrill of using it. I think that'd be marvelous for him. I hope that you enjoyed meeting some of the people who once called Claremont home. And I know you will have a wonderful time at Claremont. The house, gardens, grounds, and woodland trails are a great place to visit at any time. Whether you prefer history, art, architecture, picnicking, hiking and exploring, or just looking at the passing ships and sailboats on the Hudson River, the past comes alive at Claremont every day of the year.